I looked again at the group of men. They had not changed their positions at all. However, the luminosity was gone, and so was the buzzing in my ears. I felt relieved. I thought that the hallucination of hearing my mother's voice was over. Her voice had been so clear and vivid. I said to myself over and over that for an instant the voice had almost trapped me. I noticed vaguely that Don Juan was looking at me, but that did not matter. It was the memory of my mother's voice calling me that was mesmerizing. I struggled desperately to think about something else, and then I heard her voice again, as clearly as if she had been behind me. She called my name. I turned quickly, but all I saw was a dark silhouette of a shack and the shrubs beyond it. Hearing my name caused me the most profound anguish. I whined involuntarily. I felt cold and very lonely, and I began to weep. At that moment, I had the sensation that I needed someone to care for me. I turned my head to look at Don Juan. He was staring at me. I did not want to see him, so I closed my eyes. And then I saw my mother. It was not the thought of my mother, the way I would think of her ordinarily. This was a clear vision of her, standing by me. I felt desperate. I was trembling, and I wanted to escape. The vision of my mother was too disturbing, too alien to what I was pursuing in that peyote meeting. There was apparently no conscious way to avoid it. Perhaps I could have opened my eyes if I really wanted the vision to vanish, but instead I examined it in detail. My examination was more than merely looking at her. It was a compulsive scrutiny and assessment. A very peculiar feeling enveloped me as if it was an outside force, and I suddenly felt the horrendous burden of my mother's love. When I heard my name, I was torn apart. The memory of my mother filled me with anguish and melancholy, but when I examined her, I knew that I had never liked her. This was a shocking realization. Thoughts and images came to me as an avalanche. The vision of my mother must have vanished in the meantime. It was no longer important. I was no longer interested in what the Indians were doing either. In fact, I had forgotten the Maitote. I was absorbed in a series of extraordinary thoughts. Extraordinary because they were more than thoughts. These were complete units of feeling that were emotional certainties indisputable evidences about the nature of my relationship with my mother. At a certain moment, these extraordinary thoughts ceased to come. I noticed that they had lost their fluidity and their quality of being complete units of feeling. I had begun to think about other things. My mind was rambling. I thought of other members of my immediate family, but there were no more images to accompany my thoughts. Then I looked at Don Juan. He was standing, and the rest of the men were also standing and then they all walked towards the water. I moved aside and nudged the boy who was still asleep. I related to Don Juan the sequence of my astounding vision almost as soon as he got into my car. He laughed with great delight and said that my vision was a sign, an omen as important as my first experience with Muscalito. I remember that Don Juan had interpreted the reaction I had when I first ingested peyote as an all-important omen. In fact, he decided to teach me his knowledge because of it. Don Juan said that during the last night of the Maitote, Mescalito had hovered over me so obviously that everyone was forced to turn towards me, and that's why he was staring at me when I looked at him. I wanted to hear his interpretation of my vision, but he did not want to talk about it. He said that whatever I experienced was nonsense in comparison to the omen. Don Juan kept on talking about Mescalito's light hovering over me and how everyone had seen it. That was really something, he said. I could not possibly ask for a better omen. Don Juan and I were obviously on two different avenues of thought. He was concerned with the importance of the events he had interpreted as an omen, and I was obsessed with the details of the vision I had had. I don't care about omens, I said. I want to know what happened to me. He frowned as if he were upset and remained very stiff and quiet for a moment. Then he looked at me. His tone was very forceful. He said that the only important issue was that Mescalito had been very gentle with me, had engulfed me with his light, and had given me a lesson with no other effort on my part than being around.